All right, go ahead. Hey, this is um, Sergeant First Class Retired uh, Ryan Henderson, and this is your superior self. Sir, thank you for all that you do. Thank you for protecting our country. Thank you for protecting my family. Thank you for coming on the show. Man, I appreciate you having me. It's, uh, it's an honor. Thank you so much. So, Ryan, you are the author of the book, um, the new book that's out uh, since July. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's pretty motivational. It's your story. It's, um, what is it? The, um, what is its title again? I, I, the, uh, I um, tip of the spear. Tip of the spear. Mm -hmm. And I think it's named after like what you did in the military, right? Like you were a green beret. Um, mm -hmm. And you would go in and correct me if I'm if I'm wrong, you would go in and uh, clear the path for path for others. Yes, yeah. So um, yeah, I was a uh, Green Beret 18 Charlie, which is a demolitions guy. And uh, the reason the reason why it's called Tip of the Spear is it's not you know there's there's a lot of units out there that are that are Tip of the Spear. It's just you know when we're out on patrol and whatnot, I always found my location at the very front of the patrol with a mine detector, um, clearing, you know, clearing for IEDs. So that's why I tip the spear kind of, kind of caught on. Mm. So. so, I mean, your story is remarkable. Um, let's see here. You were out doing some type of, um, were you actually engaged or were you kind of just doing like a patrol thing when, uh, your story pretty much begins? Um, when the accident when, occurred oh uh, yeah um stepping on the id yeah we were actually uh we were actually infilling into a village um to to do a village clearance op and it was um it was still dark out it was early early morning september 12th 2010 and um and yeah that's when i when i stepped on the ied so it was uh we were actually getting ready to clear um an entire uh uh, village by uh, right alongside the Hellman River in Hellman Province. So. Wow, man! So you you step on the IED. Like, do you have any memory or recollection up to that point or after? Oh yeah, I remember the whole thing. <laughs> really? Oh yeah, the whole thing. Yeah, as much so as I wanted to. Uh, walk me through that. Yeah. Um, so yeah, like like I was saying, I mean, I I definitely remember everything as as much as I wanted to kind of pass out to make the pain go away. But um, like I was saying, we were <clears throat> we were heading into the village to begin our clearance off, and um, first set of first set of compounds. Um, I went up, you know, um, basically with with our team of Afghans, and I couldn't get them to move. They weren't. They, I was, hey man, we need to get inside this compound they were now nah, we're not moving so um i guess kind of getting to the point um our uh, we had a our interpreter went down to the main to the main breach point of the uh, compound or i guess door but it's it's just a breach point and uh he was he was trying to the this uh this door was just a bunch of sticks and um and i turned around and if we you know if you lose your uh interpreter well you, you basically lost the initiative because you can't you can't communicate with your afghan forces so i you know i went down there as quick as i could and grabbed a hold of him was like hey man you, you need to get off the like what are you doing and so i, I pulled him back and i remember like you never want to have your back to a door to an un, uncleared area and so i had stepped into the breach point or the doorway to have at least my M4 um, inside of the compound, or not inside, but at least my M4 pointing um, inside the compound in case you know we got engaged, and that's when I stepped on the IED right mm. there. So, wow, man, that is nuts. I mean, you, that's got. I mean, so like when that went off, like. It probably, I don't know, like, do you, did you become conscious, like, like a couple minutes after, I mean, like you said, you remember everything, like you got, you got hit, probably didn't feel too much, right? Like right away, like because of the shock of it. 
yeah no i didn't i didn't feel anything i i never and i never passed out so um right when i stepped on it i remember there was this flash of light and then um i couldn't breathe and i i didn't even remember it being that loud it wasn't loud at all for me anyways <laughs> but um it was a, that flash of light and then i i couldn't breathe and it was like man i i can't breathe i need to and i thought i was gonna like suffocate mm. Um, with the dust and the ammonia from the from the blast and anything like that and man I need to I need to get out of here but I couldn't move what and what is going on so I'm, I'm just getting pissed um, but still no pain and um, you know I'm calling out for um, our interpreter his you know because I thought like he got blown up or something like that and and, um, and as the dust starts to clear um, and I'm able to breathe again I remember like just taking these really short sips of air because you know it's every time you breathe heavy you're just sucking all that dust and everything else in and um as as the dust kind of cleared up I looked down and my my boot was you know like six inches away from my leg Mm. and I was like and I remember I was trying to figure out you know how'd my boot get there I didn't take it off I don't think and um then as the dust cleared even more I saw you know I saw my my tib and my fib um sticking out of the bottom of my pant leg just pearly white <laughs> and then i was like oh okay yeah this is uh, all the training i've been through this is bad <laughs> and so yeah that's that's kind of how it all and then the pain kicked in and let me tell you what whew, <laughs> i bet i bet. I wouldn't recommend stepping on an ied it hurts <laughs> so like how long did it take you to get out of there like did you immediately like get evacuated i mean how what did that look like so for my for for the guys on my team to actually get to me it took it took a couple minutes it was like three to five minutes because um i had wandered into like a minefield uh, an area full of ieds and uh, so they couldn't just run straight up to me um taliban loved to do that where they put we have a saying where there's one there's five um but so they couldn't just run up to me. And um, I remember I was, I was able to look back and uh, my team starts like 20 meters from me and he's yelling, you know, don't move. And I'm like, where do you think I'm going to go, man? <laughs> um, but yeah, I remember I was like, damn, dude, I'm, I'm going to die in this shithole alongside the Hellman river. It's like, man, this is okay. But um, my team got to me. Um, and then the Taliban came over uh, the radio or ICOM chatter, how they communicate with each other. Well, we're able to intercept their communications because it's just FM. It's nothing encrypted sure, or anything. Sure. And they were celebrating and everything like that. And then, you know, basically the call came out like, hey, we need to ambush these guys now. They have a guy down, so we need to ambush them. And that's when it was like, all right, we just need to get Ryan. We need to get out of here. And so... Oh uh, yeah, they just tourniqueted, um, put some bandages on, and we took off. <laughs> and then they came in and dropped a bunch of bombs, and yeah. So that is crazy. And for those who, I, I'm sorry for getting right into it, but I just been I, I did some research on you today, and I just been like eager to talk to you. So it's like you are uh, you were in the Green Beret, right? So for can you explain mm-hmm. that to the people? What what um what that's it's like the navy seals right but it's a different type of military for the military well we're yeah we're in the army so the um so the navy has the seals army we have the uh green berets uh ranger regiment and then air force they have their combat controllers pararescue marines have their um their marine special operations or marsoc and whatnot um but we um so our training is it it's about for for just your um, <clears throat> like engineer or weapons expert or something like that, it's about fifteen months of training, and it's you know it's pretty intense and whatnot. Um, and that's that's basically flash the bang, and then you get your green beret and you go to a group or whatnot like that. So, but we specialize in um, unconventional warfare along with um, seven you know seven other like key um, aspects of our job. But unconventional warfare is what we is what we actually, you know, we specialize in. And that's, you know, going in behind enemy lines and building up a resistance force, force multiplying, stuff like that. So um, I really, 
I really liked that mindset. Um, I, you know, the seals are amazing at what they do. Rangers mm -hmm. are amazing at what they do. Um, but their job revolves around direct action and pulling the trigger and pulling the trigger. It's, it, it's a lot of fun. Um, and it's, you know, but it's easy. And I, I, I liked the aspect of, you know, like the mental, the mental mind field, I guess, <laughs> no pun intended, but, you know, working with indigenous forces and training them up to, to, you know, um, stand on their own or, or, or force multiply and training villagers up to, to defend their villages against the Taliban and stuff sure. like that. And I just, yeah, I, I love that aspect of, of, um, my job with unconventional warfare and, um, and yeah, then we got the, you know, we have all the other dudes out there, you know, SEALs, Rangers, Marsoc, those guys just amazing at what they do. But all you guys are amazing, man. You guys, I mean, every single one of you, everybody in the military going out there and volunteering their lives for people, yeah. especially myself, man. You know what I mean? Like it just every single one of you guys are special. Um, so the training for that. Um, so, all right. So your career, right? When did you go into the military? Was it right out of high school? Yeah, so I um I grew up in a small town in Oregon, um, Lowell, Oregon. It's like, I, I think we had at that point in time, like twelve hundred people in the town. So yeah, pretty small. <laughs> and um and you know when I when I turned eighteen, my dad was you know my dad was like, hey man, um you got a few options here. You can you can go to college, but let's fa let's face it, you're not college material. I was like, yeah, no. Um, <laughs> You know, you can go out and get a job and go and he said, or or join the military. You know, this is the mid 90s. He's like, join the military and go see the world on the government's dime. There's no war going on, nothing like that. And he's he's like, do it for four years, come back and then and then see what you want to do. But you, you can't stay here because if I let you stay here, you're never going to leave this town. You're going to be the guy at 40 years old pumping gas at the gas station telling high school football war stories. Um so you got to go. So I remember um, the the army, believe it or not, in the mid 90s, they didn't need anybody. Uh, the Air Force, uh, they looked at my test scores and they're just like, yeah, that's real cute, dude. No, mm -hmm. uh, the Marine guy at the Marine recruiter came in and he's like yelling and screaming in our high school gymnasium and chew spit flying everywhere. And I was like, oh, my God, you're scary, dude. Like, -uh. he, he, he scared me out of joining the Marines. And then the Navy guy came in and it was like, he might as well had on like the, the Hawaiian shirt and was, Hey man, you want to, you want to fly F-14 Tomcats like Tom Cruise and Top Gun? I'm like, yeah. He goes, you want, you want to be a Navy SEAL like Charlie Sheen? I'm like, yeah. Exotic ports with exotic women. I was like, yeah. He goes, well sign here. I was like, damn. I was like, man, I exotic ports. Yeah, that happened. But everything else, no, nah, didn't happen. <laughs> I was like, no. Nah. So and that's, yeah, I, I came into the Navy, did uh, four years in the Navy, got out, and then um, kind of traveled around, tried my hand, you know, in the civilian world, didn't work out so well for me. So then I joined the Air Force, and um, I was in the Air Force for five years, and then I switched directly over from the Air Force to the Army, where I went um, through infantry, jump school, and then eventually onto the Q course and became a Green Beret, so awesome man so is it hard to like switch types of ser services like that to go from the navy to the air force to, to the army is that is that hard to do uh so no it was it was extremely easy for me i had a break in service from the navy to the air force though so um basically joining the air force was just like i was a day one you know brand new kid at 18 years old joining the military um to go from the air force straight over to the army I was surprised. It was super easy. It was like two weeks and I was in boot camp, um, infantry basic. And they're like, wow, I'm, <laughs> I'm 29 years old, E6, and I'm in basic. I was like, geez, that's, that suck. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. So, like, describe, oh, I don't know, describe like boot camp to people. Like, is it as bad as people think it's, think it is? Um, for me, no, because, you know, my dad, uh, my dad ran a very um, strict, you know, regimented type of uh, upbringing. 
So for me, um, boot camp, it, it, it wasn't bad at all. It was a culture shock when I joined the Navy at 18 because I've never been, you know, I mean, to a major city, let alone uh, Chicago, where yeah. Navy boot camp was at. And, um, and it was a culture shock because just meeting people that were from all over the United States and I, you know, my world revolved around Oregon. Um, but no, it wasn't, it wasn't hard at all. Um, and I mean, if you grew up with my dad, you could take an ass chewing. So it wasn't like, <laughs> it wasn't, you know, someone's yelling at you. You're like, okay. Yeah. Well, um, oh, man. So fast forward, what made you want to be a green beret though? I mean, like, was there, you talked about, you know, your, in, your inspiration, um, before, but like, was there an, a moment or an event that led up to that? That was like, man, I need to get into the green berets. Yeah, there actually was. Um, when I was in the Air Force, I deployed to Iraq in 2004, and we were on, you know, we were on a um, in Kirkuk Air Base over there. And you know, our life was easy. We'd get mortared and stuff, but that's that's nothing. That's 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 easy. But these these guys kept like they would come in and they would leave, and they were bearded out, and I'm just dirty. And but they, you know, they'd come back just. I mean, in my mind, it looked like a movie kind of, man, who are these guys? And um, so when my dad was in Vietnam, um, he worked hand in hand with the Green Berets. And so he, um, he'd always talked about it and stuff like that. Well, um, when, you know, when they told, you know, I, I think it was at the gym and I started talking to one of the guys and he's like, yeah, I used to be in the Air Force and I switched over to the Army and now I'm a Green Beret. And it's like, oh, crap that's what actually put the first seed in my head. Like, Oh, that's, that's actually something you can do. And, um, it wasn't until, you know, four years later when I actually went down the same path he did, but yeah, they just, it was just, it was just crazy watching them, you know, come they, they leave in like two Hilux vehicles, guns and everything like that. And I was just like, Holy cow, this is, <laughs> like, this is the only stuff you see on a movie. <laughs> it was just so cool to me you know they'd come back three four five days later because we were always on the on the gate pulling gate guard and stuff like that and they'd come back in and just like man i just need to shower eat work out and go to sleep it's like damn man that's that's just so cool <laughs> so yeah i mean that's that sounds like the life to me man going out kick some ass come back shower up lift some weight and you know yep go to bed that's and that's what it was it was it was just awesome <laughs> so. <laughs> all right so going back to um you know the the injury so you get blown up essentially um and they take you they get you out they evacuate you out take you to the hospital i'm assuming um and like, tell me what, pick me up from there. Like what happens next? Say, basically say your, your leg's done. Like, what do they say to you? So when I, um, so when, when the medevac um, chopper got in there and got me out finally, um, they had first brought me to a uh, um, fire base, uh, Taren Cout. We call it TK, but um, they brought me there and that's where, that's where they do like the emergency um, surgical treatment on you. It's like, Hey, um, they kept they kept you stable enough to get from the battlefield to here. Um, but, you know, I was at a point there to where it's like, hey, we need to get to work or this dude's going to die. So I got treated there. Um, and then they flew me uh, to CAF, Kandahar Airfield, which is the major hospital there for for troops. And then I remember, I don't really remember much of CAF, but I remember I woke up in, in Bagram Airfield, which is north. And they had to they had to land me there because um, I kept I couldn't every time I they get up in the air I would like go into these weird um, well they couldn't stabilize me you know blood pressure and all this other crap I I don't know so they uh, got me in uh, Bagram Airfield and um, and that's that's when it was basically like hey you know you've uh, you 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 have a lot of infection and stuff like that. Um, so the best choice there was to um, basically keep my limb, my upper and the lower part of my limb kind of together with wound vacs everywhere. Um, and, and they were just pumping me full of something to kill um, infection and the disease, like the, the, the debris and the IED had um, human feces in it. So, mm -hmm. yeah, a little really? 
yeah a little nasty surprise but um <laughs> yeah i know <laughs> dicks. i think it'd be funny if the guy was taking a shit on it and it went off on him but <laughs> whatever um but um so then they got me to germany and it was the same same song and dance i had a couple of blood transfusions there and then they were um they were like hey we're we're gonna keep keep the limb together as much as we can to get you back to the States to where we can actually do real stuff, I guess. I, yeah. I don't, you know, you know yeah. what I'm saying? Um, and then when I got back to the States, uh, to Brooks Army Medical Center in Texas, they, um, in 2010, there was a lot of, uh, there was a lot of medical like innovation and technology and research going on. And we had nothing but tons of, troops coming back from Iraq and Afghanistan just tore up from IEDs. And so one of the, one of the research pro, um, programs that was going on was um, limb salvage. And so basically what used to be a amputated limb, they were, they were, they were trying to save um, and, and, and save limbs for these guys. So um, I had come in and they had basically told me like, Hey, look, you, you have a lot of damage done, but we think, um, we think we can, you're a good candidate for this limb salvage program. It's like, okay, well, what is that going to do? And they said, well, we haven't had a limb like yours. Um, so basically we would be reattaching your leg. And if it works, um, then it's going to, it's, it's going to do some good stuff for medical research. And I was like, cool. And if it doesn't work, well, you already were without a leg. So what does it matter? It's like, cool. So, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, you know, I'll put my, I'll put my Halloween pirate costume on hold for a while. So <laughs> the eye underwent all that. And, um, and yeah, I went through all the skin grafts and I mean, there are 27 surgeries on my leg. So a lot more stuff than just that, but yeah, the skin grafts took the very first time, no infection, no blood, um, no, um, blood or bone infection. And I was able to grow back like three inches of my tibula to connect the um, the bottom of my tip to the top of my tip um, with my leg and in, inside of this thing they call a uh, x-fix it's just a big bird cage with tons of bolts going into your bone and they just hold the bone steady right above each other and depending on how hard you work yourself during physical therapy is how quick the bone's going to grow because bone grows with friction so so I just decided all right <laughs> I'm trying to get back so I, I'm just going to pound the crap out of myself and go from there. So, so what was the time frame? I mean, you're from when you got in Texas to 27 surgeries later, like how long was that time frame? Um, so I got to Texas, like the, maybe the 28th of September around there, 27th, 28th. And then through all of those surgeries, I think I was finally done with surgeries in like December. Damn. And that was all in Texas. I, yes. Mm -hmm. And then I started all the, I started all the physical therapy and the re rehabilitation process. And I was released with my leg attached in November, 2011 to return back to uh, seven special forces group. So a little over a year. Mm -hmm. Oh my God, dude. How, how does somebody do that? Like, how do you basically lose your leg? They give you this experimental treatment or experimental surgery bird cage that you were describing mm -hmm. and you're able to get back in over a year, like re-enlist, right? Like go back into active duty and, and go back, not just to the air force or Navy or whatever, but to the green beret, the, the, the unit that you left, like that is some crazy shit. Like, how do you, like you said, like it's how hard you work yourself and physical training it, that determines how fast that those bones grow back. You must've busted your ass through some physical training, bro. Yeah. I mean, I, uh, I did, there was, the, I remember multiple times peeking everywhere. I also remember, um, I know, I know I don't want listeners to get this the wrong way, but I roll in with like three fentanyl lollipops sticking out of my mouth and, and that would um, numb the pain. And then I would just, I would just go to, go to town, but it's, I don't know. I think, I think the biggest thing with me was um, 
you know, I, I started going down the self pity road and the, um, and, Oh, you know, look at what happened to me, you know, and, um, and I can't, and, you know, through my dad, um, talking with me and, and, and helping me kind of, kind of quit feeling sorry for myself. It's like, you're a 18 Charlie green beret. What, what'd you really think was going to happen? It's like, Oh, oh yeah, that's a really good point. And he goes, Oh, and you volunteered for it. So I was like, yeah, good point. But, um, I think the biggest thing for me was, you know, the two choices I was given by my dad. And he said, you know, you can become the victim of this injury and you can, and, and you can live the victim mentality. You can, you can become the man, Ryan Hendrickson injured in Afghanistan. You can never move past that. And, and, and you can make that who you are and no one's going to blame you for it, but you know, it's, that's a lonely, lonely, you know, life. And that's a, that's a very dark road or, you can use this situation to make you stronger. You can use this situation to make you a better man. You can use this situation to, to everything that you're laying in your hospital bed right now saying, man, I wish I wouldn't have done that. Or I wish I would have done that. Or I wish I was more like this. You can do that. Now you have, you, you get the reset, button. many people never get the reset, button, and you got it. So everything right now um, that, you know, is going through your head, you can actually make it happen. He said, and uh, you know, I pretty much, I see those as your two options, but I warn you becoming a victim is very easy and it's almost impossible to survive. So yeah. So I just, I, I, I did all that because I, I, I just didn't want, I didn't want to be a victim of, you know, my injuries. I, it, you know, shit happens. Life is hard. And Oftentimes, you know, a lot of, a lot of the youth today won't believe it, but it's ugly. <laughs> and, when, and, when did you make that decision though? Like when you were like, all right, I'm going back to the green beret. I'm going active duty. Like a lot of people don't like I, it, that's experimental. Like the surgery that you experienced, like that's experimental. Like it's not proven that you it, it would even, even work. I mean, you weren't even out of PT, right? Like, I mean, physical training, like and did you make your decision then, like during physical training that you would try to work your way back into Green Beret? Or was it like, let me just walk before I can run, see where I feel, or how I feel, finish this, and then maybe. But like, how did that look for you? Did you already make up your mind or were you kind of like feeling your way through it? I made up my mind in, um, in October or November laying in my hospital bed. <laughs> really? I made, it, I made up my mind. I was, I was going to go back to Afghanistan. Uh, Taliban, Taliban weren't going to beat me. I wasn't going to let them. Wow, man. That is just phenomenal. That is a, a mindset. Like, but I mean, that's something like a lot of people struggle with. I mean, you see it all the time with people, especially people that get injured over there and they come back. Like you said that the victim, the victim story is very easy to fall into just because yeah. of, you know, obviously one, you're away from your brothers, right? Like mm -hmm. when you go over there, those are your brothers. Like you're fighting side by side and, and you're sometimes the relationships that you develop over there are stronger than family relationships back here. Yeah. You yes. that, and you hear a lot of, a lot of times like soldiers will come back injured and feel guilty. Like they mm -hmm. feel guilty because they left their brothers over there or sisters or whomever and say like, they're fighting the fight. I feel guilty that I'm here. Like I'm not over there with them. I should be there with them right there. Did you feel that at all? Uh, yes. Yeah. I, I battled with it. Um, I bet. Yeah. I battled with it immensely. And also, um, in yeah, September, um, guys, like guys in my company, um, they were coming back without legs, you know, um, in September chewed a lot of guys up. Um, I actually, um, I actually had, you know, one of my buddies, he was shot and killed, um, right after, right after I stepped on the IED, uh, they were going in the same area that we were just in to, to basically clear, clear the valley like we did and and he was killed during that mission um but a couple other of my friends yeah um stepped on ieds both legs gone um another another guy just single leg amputee yeah mm. it's just yeah I'm, I'm i'm in the hospital and and guys are just yeah the war is just it, it's getting pretty nasty so Ooh, that sucks man that sucks um yeah, I, I just I, I've I've heard a lot of stories about guys not just not being able to come back from that. And, and it's, you know, it's a miracle that you were able to one go through that, that um, experimentation and then 
to even get through the PT physical training to come back. And then like, what was the, like, did you have to pass some tests before they let you come back as a green beret? Oh yeah. So um, I, I was actually medically retired and I fought to come back on the active duty through a waiver program. And then when I got released from Brooks army medical center, they, um, when they sent me back to my unit, I was non-deployable, you know, dead man's profile, can't stand for more than 30 minutes, you know, but, you know, military, they're like, hey, we spent all this money to train you to become a Green Beret. Uh, we think, um, you know, we can still get something out of you. You can sit at a desk and do paperwork or whatnot. Well, um, we we had a program at 7th Group and all the groups have it. Um, actually, most of the military has it. It's a return to fight program. And um, we called ours the, the Thor three program. And um, basically if you get their blessing, um, you're, you're pretty much good. So I just, I took the same thing that I went through at Brooks Army Medical Center when I got myself back and I, I took that work ethic and I was, I was out doing guys that had never been injured, you know, always, always carrying my load, their load, everybody. And so um, I had gotten the nod, like, yeah, you're good to go back to your ODA. And my ODA was in Afghanistan. So I, uh, I caught the next thing hot out of, uh, <laughs> out of the States to Afghanistan and showed up and there, there were some surprise people, but you know, it, 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 it did, worked. You, did, did you not tell them that you were trying to surprise them? So it wasn't that I was trying to surprise them. It's that the comp my company had deployed to Afghanistan and, um, Everybody pretty much, you know, they all knew I was on or I was non-deployable. Well, um, the big army had me as non-deployable. Seventh group can actually take responsibility over that and say, hey, we understand what your diagnosis is, but we're going to go ahead and deploy him. We can use him downrange for, you know, who, who knows? You could be sitting in the operations center just typing on a keyboard for nine months. It's not, you know. And so um, they took. They took responsibility for that. Well, my company sergeant major and a couple of people, they weren't really tracking all that. And so when I showed up, it's like, hey, um, yeah, who's the incoming passengers? We got so and so, so and so, Ryan Hendrickson, so and so. Wait, what? Like, what are you doing here, dude? It's like, surprise. <laughs> so, that's gotta be a good feeling though. Like be reuniting with your family, man. Like that, that's gotta be amazing. Yeah, it, it, it was a good feeling and it was also bad. So the problem is, is a lot of those guys, when I went back to my team, they all knew what happened to me because they were there. They saw it. They saw my leg completely meatloafed and they were like, dude, you're lucky to be alive, let alone, you know, like yeah, Ryan's gone. He's out of the military. And now here I'm shelling back up. So their mindset is like, Hey man, we're, we're so happy to see you, but can you hold your own? Like you're, we're in the most IED area in Afghanistan in 2012. It was the Panjway district of Kandahar province. And, you know, listeners that know that area, they'll be like, Oh, yep. That's super bad area. But that's where I, that's where I went to. And I, I show up and the team is just like, what, what are you doing here, dude? They could have sent you anywhere else. Why are you here? Like surprise. <laughs> So yeah, there was, there was a lot of having to prove yourself. And I understand that. I completely understand it. So were you able to do like most of the stuff that you could do before? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. It, I mean, it, it sucked and it hurt, but, um, but yeah, there was, yeah. In the, in the end, I mean, guys were like, dude, it's, it's like you never even got injured. Yeah. yeah it's just, but yeah, it, the pain, phew, pain was, yeah, but there's something worse than pain. And that is, that's, that's failing. And, um, and so I, I can suck up pain all day long to not be a failure. So. Um, well, you also won the silver star, which is mm -hmm. the third highest personal decoration for valor in combat. Mm -hmm. Can you explain how you like, was it the first, like, was it the first time in Afghanistan with the IED that, that you got awarded that or not, not earned that, I guess you'd say, or is it the second time? No, it was actually the third time. Oh, okay. Third time. Okay. Yeah, Can't keep you out of Afghanistan. Huh? Yeah, I got seven deployments <laughs> there. So <laughs> so the first time there was when I stepped on the IED and um and and I was awarded the um 
army combination medal with valor so i was like oh that's you know awesome but then um 2016 we had uh we were on a mission in Boglin and um we had we had stirred up a hornet's nest like they can't even portray it really in movies. It's it's something like I've never seen before. Um, I mean, I I know like in the village alone, we had over seventy IEDs that we found, and um, we were we were in a gunfight uh, for, gosh, well I, I don't know, probably eighteen hour gunfight, and uh, we I, I uh, the roundabout number, but it was we had uh, twelve um, Afghan commandos. Uh, they were they were killed in action. Uh, probably about 15 of them were wounded in action. We had four Americans wounded in action. Taliban almost shot down a um, um, shot down an Apache helicopter. Um, it's it was it was the most intense thing I've ever seen. But um, but basically, at the, the end of the mission, we um, you know you always get a head count, personnel count, and I was still missing two of my Afghan mine uh, mine clearance guys. Um, they were still missing in action. It's like, well, we're not, we're not leaving until we have everybody. Like, I, I, I don't care what, where they're from, who they are, you know, they're, you know, we're not leaving without our, without our fallen comrades. And so, um, yeah, just in enemy fire, under enemy fire, um, going and retrieving, retrieving our dead and um, making sure that they, uh, they got back to, you know, their bodies got back to their families, so their families can, you know, mourn them properly and and celebrate their life and, you know, and whatnot like that. So, and not having their bodies fall in the hands of the Taliban who would have desecrated the bodies and, and everything like that. So, um, that's, that's pretty much how, how, how that came about, but yeah, it was, uh, yeah, I, mm-hmm. no one, no one gets left behind. <laughs> that, that's Ever. amazing. Um, what what's going on in your mind though? Like when you're going back and retrieving those bodies, like what is it that you're thinking? And like obviously you're not I, I don't think you're thinking at all. I think you make a decision, a conscious decision. I'm going back and I'm going to manipulate my body in a way that I can maneuver through this obstacle, this these these places that um they're you know, they're shooting they, they were shooting at you, right? Like Oh yeah. Yeah. yeah so there's they're they're definitely shooting at you and it's like definitely a firefight. Like what is going on in your mind? Um, so I, I mean, you, you said it pretty good at first, uh, once you make that decision, um, and you flip that switch, um, I, I don't really know exactly what, what was going on in my mind. I, I do remember like I was in, and this will sound weird to some people, but I was scared. Um, cause I mean, seven, six, two rounds and RPGs, they're, they're scary, <laughs> um, especially zipping, zipping past your head. But I just, I, I just made up my mind. It was, you know, I, I, I have a weird belief in life and death. Um, I believe uh, there's two things in, um, two things that we don't control. We don't control life when you're born, whatnot. And we don't control death when you die and stuff like that. I believe that, and it's just, just my belief. I'm not, you know, but I believe all that was, was written before, you know, we were, we were ever even born. But what happens in between all that, it's, it's a blank it's a book with blank pages. You write your own story. And I, I think I made up my mind. Um, even though I was scared, uh, I was just like, <laughs> Hey man, no one gets left behind. Number one. And number two, if it's meant to be, it's, it, it's going to happen, but this is how it's going to happen. And, you know, regardless of their nationality, I mean, I'd go back and do it again. So. When did, uh, so you did seven tours. Mm-hmm. When did you retire? Like what year? Uh, this year, I retired January of uh, 2020. And what are you, what are you doing now? I mean, you you've written this book, which is, you know, I can't wait to get my copy. I'm going to, I cannot wait to read the story. Um, so now you're just doing the book marketing for that and, and, and trying to get your story out there and help people inspire people to, you know, push through whatever it is they're, they're, they're working through. Um, I, I would like to say that and what you just said right there, I think I need to start leaning more towards, but, um, I actually just got home from Afghanistan as a contractor Mm -hmm. and, um, I'm supposed to go back in December. And I think once I'm, once I come home from that trip, my, my eighth time over, I I think everything that you just said, I think I'm going to try and do, (laughs) 
I think I'm going to try and do all that. So that's awesome, dude. No, I think, I think, um, you know, I, I think we need more of, of, of men like you out there helping, you know, inspire. That's an inspiring story, man. Like you, I, over a year to ha- basically your, your leg is just, I mean, it's either going to be taken off or they're going to do an experimental like surgery on you and it can either work or not. And it works. It like, you know, it, it technically works. The, the legs, you know, the leg works and you have to go through physical training and you bust your ass and you get through that. And next thing you know, you work your ass to get back with your unit. I mean, that a lot of people can't say that. I think a lot of people, you know, given a, a certain opportunity would choose victimization, right? Like would mm-hmm. choose to be the victim because it's the easier route. Yeah. And apply it to the, you can apply that to any part, any, any aspect of your life. It doesn't need to be military. Mm-mm. Um, for those that are like on that verge, right? Like are on that line of victimization or action, like, what would you say to them? I mean, just like, to get them motivated to, to, or inspired to choose action over that. So that's, that's one of the reasons why I decided to write this book. Um, the book was actually therapy for me. Um, I didn't write it to be a book. I wrote it as, as like a therapeutic journal. Cause with a bit, with as big of a meathead as I am like writing, actually it, it did. It really surprised me, but it really helped me. And so um, but the victimization thing, I wrote the book in a way that it it, it does, it applies to anybody um, that's going, you don't have to be in the military to go through these things. And people may look at him, oh, well, you know, he was a Navy SEAL or he was a Green Beret or he was, or he was, you know, this or this or this. And it's, it's like, no, man, we're, we're all human beings. Pain is pain, suffering, suffering, despair is despair. But I would say as far as the victimization role goes, it's uh, becoming the victim is, is super easy. And unfortunately, like we're in a culture, I, I believe we're in the victimization culture. There's always a reason for something. Well, I grew up this way, so that's why I'm this way, or this happened to me, so that's why I'm this way. And we've actually, we have forgotten how, well, not only forgotten how, a lot of times we don't even know what it means to take control of our own lives. We don't know what it means to, when someone's like, live your life. They, we don't understand that anymore um, because, I mean, everything's given to us. We don't have to. Um, you can be the victim and be completely taken care of. You don't come home from World War I fighting in the trenches, and now you're, you're, you're coming back to, to work the farm the next day because you still got to provide for your family because nothing's free. And, you know, as, as I feel that people have forgot that, you know, that life is hard and people have forgot that, hey, you still got to do your part the victimization has increased because, you know, we allow it. And I think people, what I would say to a, um, a person who's on the verge is like, it, it, it's just telling them, you know, life, life is hard, but it can be amazing too. And, and taking control of your own life. Cause I, I write my book because I was the victim for so many years. And you'll read about it as I was a kid. Oh, this happened to me because of this. Or growing up and oh it's their fault because of this I was always it was always some I had no idea how to just just man up <laughs> or 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 grow up you know and take control over my life and I would say that for the person on the verge I, I, I would challenge them to to see what it's like to be in control um to see what it's like to step out of of of, of the of that mindset of the you owe me I'm a victim because, and I can never do anything because and fill in the blanks, like step out and start to start to think about, well, maybe I can. And I'm, I, and I'm a decent, I'm a decent example of that. Cause I had my leg blown off and, <laughs> and I, then I had it reattached and I went back to Afghanistan and I can promise everyone listening to this. I am no different than anyone else. Oh, maybe a little dumber, but that's it. <laughs> Well, you wrote a book. I, I mean, you've done two things I've never done before. I've never had my leg blown off. I've never come back from that. And I've never written a book. I mean, you're, you're, you're very more than decent 
as far as an example of this. I mean, but you're right. I think being the victim is the easy way because um, people can't take ownership of that, right? Like it's, mm-hmm. they don't want to be the owner of their misery. They want to be able to put it on someone else. Like mm-hmm. you said, whether it be their family members or their spouse or, or their boss or, or whomever, it's like, it's easier to put the blame on somebody else because it's their fault because they can't take ownership of their own shit. They can't take ownership of their life. So to be the victim is is basically the way out, is basically the way for them to deal with that. And I think um in in your example, like like yeah, you, you could have said, No, I'm not I'm not going back. Like I'm not, you know, I, I'm I'm good, but you decided to challenge yourself and say, I'm gonna push myself to see how far I can take it. And if anything, this is like a true example of how miraculous the human body is. Like, oh, yeah, you know what I mean? Like a lot of people, like even like some of the mind over matter stuff, right? Like to to think that, you know, a lot. So I've been reading a lot of like Dr. Joe Dispenza books. And I don't know if you're familiar with him or not, but he is a um, he's, he's a little more mystical. He's he's kind of like this. He has this idea where we can heal ourselves with um, like more positive thinking and concentration on certain things. And he was uh, actually, I think he had a, he was, he was riding, he was like either he was a professional bike rider or something like he got in a car accident, like a car hit him and he was like paralyzed, right? Like he had a, a huge back injury and he was able to, through his methods, he was a chiropractor and he refused a major surgery and he was able to do his meditation and focus and intention um, and, and basically walk again. So like you're, your story is miraculous, but it's also a testament of the human body and what we're capable of. And I think, yeah. you know what I mean? Like, and I really hope that, um, you know, in your future interviews, like people get that, you know, like it's not, it's not only a great story of heroism or, or perseverance, but like also the natural, natural capabilities of our bodies. Yeah, no, I, no, I, I agree completely. I, I know it's, I mean, there's, there's a, there's a ton of t-shirts out there and there's, you know, the bumper stickers and whatnot, you know, um, positive thinking. And, but I, I, I'm, I'm telling you, like, if you listened to the diagnosis given, um, and, and you believed it, like for, for instance, for, you know, for me, for instance, um, you know, Hey, you're, you're going to be lucky if you walk again without the assistance of, you know, a wheelchair or a walker or something like that. Um, and, and you're gonna, you, you know, like active duty is done, dude. <laughs> like, no, don't even, don't set yourself up for failure because it's not going to happen. Mm-hmm. And, and the thing is, is, you know, I, it, it's that I, I understand medical technology. I really do. Um, and I understand why people come up with that. What I don't understand is how our thoughts, um, actually, what, what they can do with recovery. All I know is like, I was so driven that it just, it happened that way. And so my conclusion without any, uh, you know, medical uh, uh, education or anything like that, my conclusion is, is, is yeah, I, I mentally wanted it so bad that it, that it happened, you know? Um, yeah. I'm not taking anything away from you. Like this is a hundred percent like will, right? Like this is you just being that guy that's going to be like, I'm going to, I'm going to push myself to the, I'm going to push mm-hmm. myself past my limits. And I get that. Like there are times in my life where I have to push myself past my limits. Not, you know, mm-hmm. I don't have a silver star. I was second team all conference. That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just messing. It's like nothing compared to what you have, but, um, you have to put yourself past your limits to know who you really are and what you're truly capable of. And then it's like, it's like the, what is that? Um, the guy who ran the fastest mile, I can't remember his name. You shouldn't like, um, Oh my God, why am I forgetting it? Anyway, remember when they were like, you can't run a, there was no way you could run a four minute mile. Um, Mm -hmm. and then the guy did it and like, they were like shocked by it. And then next thing you know, everybody's running like four minute miles or six minutes. It's not four minutes, six minute miles. Um, I'm going to kill myself thinking about this. Um, wasn't just, it that kid, like when he was training, he was just training and 
his buddy was always on the bike and he was chasing after the bike and yeah i'm trying to think of the yeah i saw that movie i can't remember though it is uh give me a minute i'm gonna google um, i know prefontaine is big in my area well, in yeah, Oregon. That's all i say like you're you're in the like the hub of running um <laughs> i know hold on i'm gonna see who broke it four minute mile <laughs> Anyway, I can't find it, but it's like the six, six minute mile, um, that thought where it was impossible. Like nobody can do it. Nobody can break that. And then somebody did it. And then it's like, oh, well, that, that opens up a possibility for us. Like, you know what yep. I mean? Like, oh, maybe we can do it. And now people start visualizing themselves doing that. And then they can, they're capable of that. Like, don't you think it's just crazy? Like how the universe lines up that you experience this horrific injury you get flown into texas and they're just out of the blue you know not not out of the blue but they're just they're just experimenting with this surgery process that they're going to line up for you and that you're a candidate for and then next thing you know you're working your way back so like i think me personally just being the person i am it's like you know this lined up for you for you to be able to tell the story to help some people mm -hmm. you know what i mean I, I've definitely looked back at the time frame of everything, especially jumping from Navy to Air Force to Army and and kind of how my life is lined up to this point. And, you know, stepping on the IED I did because the IEDs that were in that village, they were they they were ones that you step on and it and and you're it's just a pink mist. There were some I stepped on one of the smaller IED, you know, how I got that one IED that you know, just blew my leg off and it didn't pink miss me. And then getting to Texas and those guys just happened to be there at that time. And then this program just happened. Yeah. It's, it's crazy how things line up. I mean, that's, and that's the thing with victimization is you never get to experience that kind of stuff. If you never allow yourself to step out of your victim role, you know what I mean? I love that dude. And just FYI, it's the banister effect. So Woods Wooderson Bannister. That's a that's an odd name, but it's called the Bannister effect. Um he broke the record and of the six minute mile. And then the Bannister effect is essentially ideas that you think that cannot happen, and then somebody does it and then everybody starts doing it. You know what I mean? Yeah. <clears throat> so it's like, I don't know. I just think like your story is is to be printed in a book to inspire somebody out there to see that you know you can have your leg basically blown up you know and 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 with the help of technology with the help of modern medicine get back out there and grind out and and, and to mm -hmm. get out there and fulfill your mission and complete it not only twice but five more times and win the silver star, man. Like, I mean, that is a huge inspiration, man. Like that's, I mean, that your story is to, is definitely got to be told. It's, it's definitely got to get out there. And I think you're going to do some great work, man. Yeah, I, I hope so. I, I really do. And it's, um, it's more, it's more for the fact that I see, um, I, I see what's going on today. And I honestly, I, I really do believe a lot of the issues we have, is is the fact that people are all a victim of something and we've yeah. again we've just we've lost the ability to own our own lives and part of that is is owning your mistakes too you know i mean people ask me about failure i was like i know failure way more than i know success but that's the reason why i know success is because i'm really good at failing <laughs> yeah, but failure is just like i think to me failure is just like you know obviously all right let's so let's just be honest here right like so if it could have gone two ways right if, if the the if the surgery didn't work out you would have you would have lost your leg that there's no failure in that that is just you know that is a repercussion of war right mm -hmm. but it did work and you worked your ass off i think failure is quitting you know like not trying anymore i think that's failure right like even if you yeah. come up short every time every every attempt i th i still think that is a win i think it just gets you closer to that goal and even if it like 
some people think that like, if you don't get a certain goal, that that is failure, right? Like, but I feel like even if your pursuit towards a goal at a certain point in your life gets to, you know, you diverge from that route to a different goal, that isn't failure. That's just, that is just you growing or you changing your belief system or whatever. I think failure is when you completely stop doing anything. Like, yeah. even if you lost your leg, right? If you would stop trying to live, that is failure. But yeah. me knowing you in the short time, I, I can't see you doing that. However, mm-hmm. I just want people to realize that failure is just completely giving up on life, completely giving up on yourself and completely giving up on the world and just living in that victimized mind state. I think, um, yeah. and I think you can agree with that. Yeah, I yeah, I think I think failure is probably a little bit stronger of a word than than I should have used, but I've definitely, you know, um what what was it? I think Michael Jordan said um he has made uh thousands and missed thousands of game winning shots. Or correction, he has missed thousands of game winning shots and he's made and he's made, you know, however yeah. many and, and he was like, but those ones that you make you know, I got that good because of the ones that I missed and stuff like that. And so, yeah, I think, I think failure is probably a little bit stronger of a word than I meant. I meant like I've, I've missed a lot of shots, but the ones that I've made, holy shit. <laughs> they count. They count. They count. Yep. You know what I mean? But, they all count. But if you're a victim, you, you, you're, you're not going to get those shots because you're not, you're not ever going to let yourself, you're never going to give yourself the opportunity to take them. And that's, I, th- I think that's that, that's my story right there. It's, you you got to take them. I think your story is putting yourself in the oppor- giving yourself the opportunity to succeed, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. I think that's awesome. Ryan, this has been amazing, man. Like how can people reach out to you? How they how can they connect with you? So I um believe it or not, I actually uh, finally finally figured out the website thing and that is hire hire the right person and you'll get a really nice website. So I'm, I actually have a website. It's uh, Ryan M And then, you know, I'm on, uh, I'm on Instagram at a uh, uh, tip of the spear RMH. And um, yeah, that's pretty much. Where can uh, they buy the book? They can get the book anywhere, right? Like Amazon, Barnes and Nobles, all that good stuff. Yeah. A lot of, a lot of guys have been uh, knocking it out of the park with Amazon. Cause I guess they're just super quick. Um, and on, on that, on my website, um, Ryan M Hendrickson.com, uh, there's links, there's big links there. That's like click here and it'll take you right to, um, three or four different links where you can purchase it. So it's awesome, man. Um, last question for you, brother. Um, mm-hmm. what do you want your legacy to be? I want my legacy basically to be regardless of what has happened to you in your past regardless of where you have came from, um, as long as you refuse to become a victim, then you're going to, you know, like, you're going to make life, you're going to own life. And that's, and that's, that's basically what it is. And you'll see in the book, like, life has been hard. (laughs) But once I figured out how to own it, you know, well, how hard was it for you a green beret to make yourself vulnerable in this book? Yeah, it's yeah, it's pretty tough. It took it, it took a lot of encouragement um, because I do I write I write some stuff in the book about um, you know some stuff that's very uh, it it's very very um, vulnerable um, and it's in the book. People read about it, but you know I went through um, I went through a phase when I was you know eight years old and I was you know sexually molested by my stepmom. And how, you know, I became a victim of that. And, and I didn't, and I didn't, I still struggle today with, you know, trust and stuff like that. But, um, but, you know, I finally just had to realize, like, bad shit happens, man. And there's, and there's some, there's some ugly people out there, but you're not the first one. And unfortunately, I hate to say it, but you're not the last either. And so understand that, that, yeah, it's, it's bad what happened. But you need to move on with life because as long as you stay in that um, in in that in that time in that mentality of what happened, you're never going to move on. It's impossible, and you're just going to become a victim of, uh, unfortunately, a, a really bad um, incident that lasted, you know, for a while. But it, it's still it's it's like life is hard, man. <laughs> 
own it, own it and move on. And, um, yeah. and so that's, you know, it's, yeah, it's all in the book, but yeah. I can't wait to get that, man. Um, <clears throat> well, I want to say thank you for your service. Thank you for everything that uh, you've done for our country. And, uh, you know, this has been a, an honor to have you on the show. Man, I, I thank you so much. This, this is awesome. It's awesome. You're, you're super easy to talk to, but I mean, you do podcasts though, obviously, but yeah, this, this, this badass, man. Thank you so much.